now we have understood uh, what is oxidation and for this process uh, for the field oxide growth we are going for the wet oxidation usually because you want to have a very thick oxide and uh, for that you you will be doing wet oxidation and now if you look into the bottom image that you see the green thing is not everywhere the green thing is only at the edges right uh, so, you wanted to remove selectively remove you you want to selectively remove I, I want to use that term specifically because when you say remove you, you will be removing it completely, but uh, when you want to selectively remove certain areas of uh, uh, a material you have to go for uh, one process called photolithography and then uh, uh, use the etching technique to remove that material. So, the second process that uh, I am doing over here is called photolithography and uh, in the entire process of fabricating uh, a microfabricated device you may have to do photolithography several times. So, uh, for that matter I am coding this photolithography step as uh, photolithography 1 and uh, in this as I have mentioned we are doing something which is exactly similar to uh, the olden day uh, photography. Uh, process where uh, you, you make a negative uh, and then you wash it and uh, then convert it in a photograph. Exactly in the same way what you do is that uh, on the top of your uh, um, wafer with oxide you are going to form a layer of uh, material called resist or photoresist. In your uh, photography film also you have a chemical on the top of the film which is light sensitive. Similarly, in uh, in here also uh, the resist or we call it as photo resist uh, is light sensitive. So, what, what is the advantage of that? If you want to pattern uh, this particular material you can expose this photo resist selectively to light. So, uh, the peculiarity of the photo resist is that uh, when light falls on this material uh, it can have some chemical reaction on this uh, this photoresist. So, there are two types of photoresist. So, first photoresist is called positive photoresist and uh, the second photoresist is called negative photoresist. So, in positive photoresist when you have light falling on that uh, that will uh, kind of dissociate and then you can wash it away. The areas where uh, light has fallen you can wash that area away. So, that is called uh, positive photoresist. Whereas, in negative photoresist in the areas where you have light uh, exposed that area will become hard and the unexposed area can be washed away. So, that is the difference between uh, positive and negative photoresist. I have in the ne in the next slide I have uh, something on that also, but here uh, as you see the yellow layer uh, I have formed uh, an yellow layer over here which is called photoresist and I am assuming it as uh, positive photoresist. And then uh, I am using something called a mask. In a mask the speciality is that uh, it has certain transparent areas uh, at the same time it has some, uh, some areas that are opaque. So, if I shine light through this mask onto my resist coated wafer the photo resist coated wafer what will happen? Through the areas where uh, light can pass the light will go and then fall on the top of the resist on the top of the photo resist. Whereas, the areas that are blocked or the areas that are opaque will not allow the light to go and fall on the photo resist and that area uh, will not have any chemical reactions. And due to this process uh, the areas where uh, light got fallen will, will dissociate and at the same time the areas where uh, light did not fall will, will stay intact. And then what you do you take this wafer uh, into a solution called developer and this process is called developing. And when you develop and then dry the areas where light has fallen will go away and the remaining areas will uh, stay. Okay. So, now you have sort of created uh, islands or some areas where uh, you can protect your uh, oxide below these islands. So, the, 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 that is the entire uh, reasoning behind this photolithography process. And in this slide uh, different classes of photoresist is explained where uh, first you apply photoresist on the top of the substrate and then uh, you shine light through a mask as I said 
and when you do developing the positive photoresist, in the positive photoresist, uh, the areas where uh, light has fallen will go away, and the negative photoresist, uh, the areas where light has fallen will stay. And that uh, difference is shown here, and that's how they are called positive and negative photoresist. And um, no, uh, how how you will code this? Uh, photoresist uniformly on the top of your wafer. Usually uh, the process that uh, the microfabrication people do is called spin coating where you keep the wafer on the top of a rotating chuck or a rotating platform and then you pour uh, this photoresist. Photoresist is uh, initially in the form of a liquid and you pour that on the top of uh, the wafer that is placed on the top of a uh, chuck or a moving platform and then you make this chuck rotate and you rotate at a, at a specific speed uh, and for a particular amount of time uh, that will yield a certain thickness of photoresist. So, three parameters that decide the uh, thickness of photoresist the first one is the speed at which you rotate, the second one is the time for which you rotate and the third one is the viscosity of the photoresist that you are uh, uh, that you are pouring on the top of the wafer. So, these three are the key parameters. There will be some other few uh, minute influences of uh, some airflow and all, but uh, these are the three key parameters that influence the photoresist uh, uh, coating process. And then what you do is that you, you allow uh, the solvent to go away from this photoresist. So, the, the photoresist will have uh, two parts, first is a uh, is a polymer part and the second one is a solvent part. So, after spin coating you do not want this solvent to be there anymore. So, you have to do a heating to uh, remove the solvent. So, that the only only the polymer layer will uh, stay uh, on the top of your wafer and the, the, that is how uh, photoresist coating is done generally and there is another process that I am not showing here is called uh, spray coating where uh, you use a spray mechanism to coat uh, photoresist on the top of this wafer. This is like exactly like your spray painting that you see in your uh, in your car painting workshop or some places where uh, they use a sprayer to coat uh, the paint on the top of the car or some place. So, th that is how you make the uh, photoresist film on the top of the wafer and then you do the photolithography and develop um, and uh, make the required pattern on the top of your uh, your wafer. And remember this pattern is made only on uh, photoresist. This pattern when you develop nothing will happen to the oxide that, that we have done as of now. This will happen only to the photoresist. And now in this slide uh, I have shown two types of uh, photolithography or lithography techniques that, that are uh, prevalent uh, nowadays. The first one is called UV lithography where people use UV light uh, uh, for uh, patterning purpose uh, and then uh, the next one is uh, uh, electron beam lithography. So, the choice of these uh, will depend on the kind of uh, dimension that you want to achieve on your wafer. Say if your uh, if your wafer dimension like the not the wafer dimension the the feature dimension on the top of wafer that you want to make uh, is more than say one micrometer or so then people will usually go for uh, UV lithography which is kind of an inexpensive technique that you can do uh, whereas when you have requirements of making structures that are uh, say in tens of nanometers or uh, or so then you have to go for electron beam lithography. The difference is that in UV lithography you shine light through the mask whereas in E beam lithography you use a, a focused electron beam to write the patterns on the top of uh, your wafer. Um, and uh, in either way both of these uh, equipments uh, either the UV lithography equipment or the E beam lithography equipment has to be kept, uh, kept in the most clean area uh, in a clean room because uh, this is one of the most uh, fundamental thing that decides the uh, the yield of your wafer. So, if your photolithography step has some errors then that will propagate that will propagate to the uh, uh, the upcoming stages. And uh, if you observe uh, 
the UV lithography image that I have shown over here, uh, the environment of UV lithography is yellow. The reason for that is if you do it in a white light area, the spin coated photoresist will react with the light. Okay, you, are, you, you are taking your wafer and you are keeping it on the top of chuck and you are spin coating and then you have to take uh, that wafer to the lithography machine. And uh, so, if you are doing it in a normal white light room after a spin coating when you take this wafer to the uh, lithography machine on the way it can get exposed to light and then uh, you may not be able to uh, uh, really do good patterning. So, uh, the environment should be yellow and the yellow light has a very minimal uh, influence on, on this photoresist and then uh, when you do lithography you will be able to get uh, very decent structures. So, uh, for the matter uh, both the UV lithography and the uh, EBM lithography are kept usually kept in, uh, in yellow rooms. So, that uh, is how certain structures are made on the top of uh, the oxide. Now, making structure on photoresist is not enough for us. What is important is that you have to make these structures in um, in silicon dioxide. It is not only in in uh, uh, the photoresist that you are going to make, but you are going to make these structures in uh, uh, in silicon dioxide. So, for that you have to use the uh, the technique that is called etching. Either you can go for wet etching or dry etching um, and this process is exactly similar to your uh, a nail paint removal process uh, where uh, in, the, in the example of the nail paint removal process I had uh, I had mentioned one thing that if you want to keep a, a particular area of uh, nail paint what you do you put a sticker and then uh, you apply uh, nail paint remover everywhere. So, that uh, the areas that are exposed to the nail paint remover will go and the areas that are protected by the uh, sticker will stay as such exactly in the same way. Uh, uh, if you have uh, your photoresist that is uh, present on some areas that will ask us uh, um, that will act as the sticker or that will ask uh, uh, act as the mask for uh, this particular uh, process. And uh, you do uh, the etching step uh, by which you can remove the uh, oxide. So, in, in etching you have two, two types of etching the first one is called wet etching and the uh, second one is called dry etching. Uh, in, in wet etching what you are doing is that you are simply dipping uh, your wafer with silicon dioxide exposed in some regions into hydrofluoric acid uh, that, that may not be always say uh, most pure hydrofluoric acid. Uh, you may have to use dilute hydrofluoric acid um, to uh, remove the silicon dioxide. Uh, as I show in the left side um, when you dip these uh, into the hydrofluoric acid what happens is that it will etch in every direction. So, it is called isotropic etching where uh, you have the etching happening in uh, uh, all directions equally. And uh, the image that is just shown below that uh, is the setup that people uh, usually use for wet etching where uh, these are called wet benches. These are called wet benches where uh, 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 they use chemicals. Uh, dangerous chemicals like HF or H2SO4 or, um, or HCl or uh, such kind of chemicals are uh, being kept in some baths and what you do is that you take your wafer after patterning and you dip uh, into this acid that is kept in a container inside this bath for a certain amount of time. And the time you know uh, uh, for how much time you need to expose this uh, you will be calculating that time and uh, dipping it. Uh, and the end result will be uh, if you are if you are timing it properly then end result will be that uh, only the required areas get removed and uh, the other areas will stay intact. But suppose if you are dipping it for more time then uh, there are chances that uh, the the fluid because HF is can is a liquid hydrofluoric acid is a liquid. So, liquid can go below the photoresist and it can etch out the silicon dioxide that is kept safely uh, below the, the photoresist. So, the timing of etching is very important. Uh, you have to do several uh, iterations uh, to standardize this etching process to understand the etch rate. Etch rate means how much uh, 
uh, silicon dioxide is removed uh, from the vapor uh, according to time. So, you, you have to have a standardization process or you need to have a calibration process for this uh, before you doing your uh, real vapor. Similarly, uh, in, in the second process that is called dry etching, you use uh, some uh, energized ions that can uh, that, that is directly uh, or some energized materials that are uh, being directly driven onto the top of your silicon dioxide and that will go uh, and either that will knock out the, uh, the silicon dioxide atoms or it will go there and then uh, react with the silicon dioxide atoms and only where uh, these atoms fall uh, that area will be removed. I mean th these are compounds basically these are C4, C4, F8 compounds and uh, areas where they fall uh, it will react with the silicon dioxide and that gets removed uh, and the other areas will get uh, uh, stayed intact. Uh, these kind of uh, etching are kind of purely vertical, vertical in nature because it, lateral etching is not happening here and such kind of uh, uh, etching process are called anisotropic etching. So, in isotropic etching what is happening is that etching happens in every direction equally whereas, in uh, anisotropic etching uh, the etching happens only in the direction uh, that uh, these compounds are being directed. And you can see the picture that is shown directly below the dry etching uh, process uh, these kind of instruments are uh, being used for such kind of uh, dry etching activities. So, now you understand uh, how we uh, have removed the silicon dioxide. Now, we have made uh, three uh, islands of silicon dioxide, but if you see in the final image you, you have only two image two, two islands of uh, silicon dioxide that is in green color, but now that I have I have gone for uh, three layers of uh, or three islands of silicon dioxide I will tell you the reason shortly. Uh, do not get confused uh, between the final image and the, this image, but finally eventually when we uh, realized device we will be having only two the middle one will not be there. And uh, after that now uh, uh, what you have done you have removed your uh, uh, silicon dioxide from the areas that are exposed uh, by either using the uh, wet etching process or using the dry etching process. Now what you have you have a substrate you have patterned oxide on the top of the substrate and on the top of the patterned oxide you have uh, photoresist. Now, photoresist is a temporary material that you that you have been coating and then you are uh, doing this thing. After each and every process what we do is that you tend to remove this photoresist uh, because you do not want this photoresist to be there when you are going forward to the uh, next step. For that what you do is uh, you uh, dip this uh, wafer uh, after etching into certain solvents. Uh, mostly uh, people dip into acetone uh, and then they dip in isopropyl alcohol and then in DA water they have a sequence of uh, uh, step that you need to follow to remove the photoresist. Or you can do uh, certain kind of plasma ashing techniques where they do not use any solvents instead of that they use some uh, energized plasma to uh, uh, maybe usually oxygen plasma they use uh, to remove this. Uh, uh, photoresist on the top of oxide. And now, uh, now we are finally having only uh, silicon substrate and on the to top of silicon substrate you have certain islands of uh, silicon dioxide. That was the fourth step. Now, uh, again this also can be uh, compared with the etching process, but th this process is not typically called etching process, but uh, this process is again called uh, uh, like uh, photoresist removal. P typically, people won't call it as etching. And uh, now we are going forward, and now uh, uh, this process is process number five, uh, where you uh, are going to realize the source and drain regions. And the process is called doping, or or we call it as diffusion. The the uh, uh, the uh, process will uh, eventually give you the magenta uh, areas that you see in the in the picture that is uh, right below uh, at the bottom right corner. How you do this is that you introduce uh, dopant equally on the top of your uh, your wafer uh, on the wafer where you have patterned your uh, silicon dioxide patterned the sense you made islands of silicon dioxide and uh, you see this red 
color thing that is the dopant and when you when you apply this red color dopant equally on the top of your uh, wafer the areas where uh, silicon dioxide is removed on those areas the dopant will uh, meet with the silicon but in the areas where silicon dioxide is not removed um, there the dopant will meet only with silicon dioxide and it will not meet with uh, silicon uh, as it is very obvious because the silicon dioxide is acting as, as a mask for uh, this doping process. And following this what you do is you will uh, subject this uh, wafer to a high temperature uh, dry bin. It is called high temperature dry bin where you heat this wafer with a dopant uh, uh, at a particular temperature for uh, some amount of time. And that will eventually give you the magenta areas that you see here. So, the advantage in having uh, the green field oxide is that over there uh, the dopants will not go into the silicon. We want the dopants to be uh, precisely positioned only at the source and drain areas. We do not want these dopants to be there uh, in the other areas. So, so, that has to be blocked and that was the role of uh, silicon dioxide and the silicon dioxide will effectively block these uh, uh, regions where uh, you do not want uh, the doping to be happen. Now, some of you must be thinking that this can also be done uh, using a photoresist is not it. So, uh, if you if you use a photoresist also you can block because you can essentially pattern your photoresist and then have this doping process. But the issue is that uh, doping happens generally happens at a high temperature and uh, photoresist will not sustain that high temperatures it will just burn off because there are these polymers and when you subject it to a temperature more than say 250 degrees Celsius or, uh, or more it will it will just go off it will just become ashes and that that area also uh, the dopant will go into the uh, silicon. So, we do not want that to happen and that is the reason why we are choosing silicon dioxide as the uh, mask for this doping process. And following that what, what you do is that uh, you remove the excess dopant with some, some mechanism basically you wash away the uh, excess dopant. Uh, and finally, you can see uh, the, the areas that are exposed the silicon areas that are exposed will only get the um, dopant whereas, uh, the other areas will not get the dopant. And this process is exactly similar to the uh, uh, the ice golem making process that I had explained right. Uh, the, the person who uh, makes this ice gola what he does uh, what he or she does is that he, he makes the um, tube of ice or, uh, or he, he or she forms the ice into a particular shape and then pour uh, the coloring agent or the flavoring agent on the top of this and then after some time this will slowly uh, go in or this will slowly diffuse in. And, um, so, this uh, so this will eventually give you uh, a, a taste or uh, or uh, some flavor uh, to your uh, to your ice color otherwise it will be just plain. But uh, say say some uh, skilled people who are making these ice colors what, what they do they they color these ice colors with different colors in different regions that that can also be done uh, in the same way that uh, we do this diffusion. Right. You, you, you pour only to some area and that area will get uh, colored in one color say in red color and the other area will get in green color. Exactly the same way you are, you are trying to do in, uh, in on, a, on, on a piece of semiconductor and that is called uh, diffusion. And now, now uh, you can match this image the, the, uh, uh, the image after removing the excess dopant uh, with the image that you see at the bottom right corner. There. Uh, now, now you can understand that you are uh, maybe halfway in in realizing this device. Now you have few more steps remaining to complete this entire fabrication. Uh, so, the the device that we use for uh, uh, doping, the the not the device, the equipment that we use for doping is also almost similar to the uh, equipment that uh, we use for uh, oxidation because both are. Uh, doing almost the same kind of process in oxidation uh, the machine supplies some some kind of gases like 
uh, either uh, oxygen or hydrogen plus oxygen and then uh, provide a high temperature for the uh, oxide growth. Whereas, in, uh, in uh, diffusion furnace also you, you do the same basically you provide the, uh, the diffusing agent or the dopant and then you, uh, you increase the temperature to, uh, to enable the dopant to go into the uh, silicon substrate. So, the equipment uh, used to look similar in some cases uh, equipment manufacturers they make uh, say if they have two or three um, towers like three of two or three different layers of tubes then uh, one layer they will make for oxidation then another layer they will make for diffusion and so on and so forth.